Welcome to the Data, AI, and Everything podcast. In each episode, we engage with leading experts and visionaries who are at the forefront of transforming the landscape of data and AI. Join us as we unravel the complexities and envision the future through the experiences and insights of our distinguished guest, Shamik Kundu. So today I have, and it is an utmost pleasure, uh, Shamik Kundu, who is the head of financial services and chief strategy officer at TrueEra, and previously the group chief data officer at Standard Chartered Bank. Shamik, thank you so very much for willing to join, and in fact, be the guinea pig of well, this little experiment that I'm doing here in terms of, I want to call it a podcast, but it's really more of a conversation. So, so welcome. Thank you so much, David. A uh, real pleasure to be here on, on the podcast with you. And I wanted to start off, I wanted to give you a bit of a kind of a backdrop to this. And to be fair, because there was no prep really. Uh, you know, all these meetings that we actually end up seeing one another, where it's, you know, it's the panels, whether it's the you know, discussions, whether it's the talks. And I kind of realized that we have that, we have those panels, we have those conversations, but then we have the conversations after the panel. We have a conversation, you know, outside the room. And I just kind of felt that those conversations at times were the ones like, hey, we should have had that insight. I don't know if you feel the same way, but, but that's kind of what kind of went like, you know what, let's try this. Yeah, uh, so, um, sometimes, sometimes I think the conversations we have outside might not be that palatable on the panel. But yes, I do agree with you. They're certainly always more interesting than the ones uh, on the panel. Well, so, I mean, given on that, and palatable or, or maps the term slightly less PC, <laughs> you know, data, look, this, this, is, this is not a new Romeo. And, and, and I, I really want to kind of dive in. And obviously, I think it was 11 years or something, you know, in doing data in a, you know, international financial institution. And now, obviously, kind of the, 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 the moving of that trend towards looking at it from a governance perspective, from a trust dimension in terms of AI. And there's one thing that always catches me that you have also have, I think, on, on your LinkedIn, and, and you do say this quite regularly when you talk about your successes and fails. Or in fact, you say the other way around. You say the failures and successes when it comes to data. And actually, that, that kind of really sticks with me. I mean, we've been talking about, in the end of the day, Govern again. Let's just call it governance for simplicity. For a very long time. Uh, what is it? I mean, are we just repeating ourselves to a certain degree? Are we kind of uh, um, solving the same problem and trying to find different ways? Or actually, is it the same problem? Or is it new? I mean, I, I'm looking at it from someone kind of veered into the world of data, I, having started actually with an AI. So when you think at the time that you've been spending, again, specifically thinking of it from an international bank, is what is data governance to you? I mean, what is those successes and failures? Is this, is this a journey moving forwards? Or actually, if we take a step back, we're kind of repeating certain things. Uh, so like most things, it's a bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's always a bit of repeating uh, yourself. That in the same organization, if you go to, I, I've only worked in one large financial institution, but I've heard people who, move multiple ones saying how it's the same problems seen again and again in different organizations. So there's quite a little bit of, quite a bit of repeating, um, partly because different organizations are at different levels of maturity, uh, partly because um, even if they have cracked a problem once, uh, institutional memory disappears, somebody new comes in and you have to reinvent and, uh, and do the same problem, things again. So there is a strong element of that, but there is also uh, an element, I would say, of, uh, and I, I've seen this particularly in the last three years of my of my career in data at Standard Chartered Bank. There's also a bunch of new things. I mean, all things considered, data governance is probably relatively new in the broader uh, scheme. Indeed, data management more broadly is a relatively new discipline in terms of being called a discipline. Uh, it's not that people haven't been managing data, but in terms of being called a discipline, it's relatively new. And in its relatively short history of perhaps two decades uh, or slightly more, um, it has seen quite a few dimensions um, come up in the last five to six years. Um, including, for example, much greater scrutiny on sovereignty, including uh, because of the very 
uh, scale of data that is available and the types of data that is available, much greater uh, focus on privacy, on data rights, on IP around data, um, on innovative ways of sharing data between uh, aspects like forcing open existing data silos, not just inside organizations, but across organizations. So even before I get into AI governance, just data governance itself has seen several new pieces. So to answer your question, why is this continuing for a while? I mean, partly because it is something that needs, it is not a once and done thing. Even if you say I set up a fantastic data governance framework and everything is working, you need to keep doing it. That's one. Um, so you do realize, no, not to interrupt you there, but just, just on the first point, I mean, you do realize that I'm, I'm pretty sure about it. Okay, I'm not pretty sure, but I would presume, perhaps I should say, that you know, if you tell CEOs or executives folks that, hey, you're going to go keep on, re you, you, you just have to keep on investing on this. It's like, it's keep, well, if this is going to continue going, they're not going to like that. So I have had that conversation, not just with my CEO, but also with boards. Um, my own board and more recently with, uh, with uh, in, in the bank, but also with Clive. And I think uh, you're right. If they're superficial, you might not like it. I think the more thoughtful board members, certainly my, my then CEO, uh, the current CEO, that Sanchar, he would get it as long as he sees something more than just, oh, I'm going to keep spending and keep doing this effort, but not get anything new in return is not acceptable, mm. right? But if you say you want to keep investing in it, and as a result, the price keeps getting bigger, even if it's not exponentially bigger, that's a different discussion. And I think that people don't necessarily accept the benefits of not just data governance, I'd perhaps use the word data management in a broader sense, but it's all around us. If you're running a large bank, 10 years ago, you had nothing close to the amount of data, forget AI, yeah. you had nothing close to the amount of data that you can have access to today, right? It's just, you know, the kinds of things we've done eight, 10 years ago, where you'd look at the, uh, the, the flows of transactions amongst your big corporate clients to understand the rest of the supply chain, to identify opportunities, to under identify risk. This is not AI. This is just for the first time understanding how the bank is at the center of big web, uh, webs of trade and who are all the players in the ecosystem, which you knew through your salesperson's intuition which you knew through your CEO, business person's intuition, but now you have all of that at a level that was just not there. So the reality is both the availability and the usefulness of data has dramatically improved. As a bank customer, most self-respecting banks will give you all your financial mm. stuff in one place. Well, that's data management as well. It might not look like that, but of course, as you know, David, now that you are running up a bank's data, those are coming from very different systems and it might look Effortless and seamless, but really, but it's it is, quite a bit of effort there. It is classic duck looking serene on the top, but underneath <laughs> a lot of paddling going on, right? So I think the more, more the more thoughtful senior execs and board members, they understand that yeah. data management, like <laughs> being a CEO, like being a CFO, is an ongoing job. But what they don't like is to say it's an ongoing job, but you won't really get anything new in yeah. return. That so so you, you, you hit something very important on there. And to be fair to to the other end, it's. There is a almost a duty to create that connection that you're talking about. Of yes, you have to deal, and I, I, I like to use the word hygiene. Maybe I mean, there's a better word. There is a foundational hygiene that you simply must do. You must adhere, and you might not like the fact that you have to pay to clean it to a certain degree. But look, you just have to because otherwise it just gets really unpleasant. Having said that, there is a duty on the people on whomever's driving and leading it is to really create that relationship of, look, this is how it's providing you the understanding in terms of the business. This is how it's not just avoiding you paying penalties from you know, the regulators, but driving the value and that connectivity. This, this beautiful duck on the top, which is you know, that, that the product, the revenue, has a very, very strong dependency even on, like you said, forget AI, those reports, those information yep. to come in and so forth. And that's something, in, in, in my view, like, you can add to this is it's not easy. It's not easy to, to shift those perspectives of, I need to fix this engine. I need to make sure, you know, the, the, the fluids are running properly. There's nothing clogged. And at the same time, zoom out and go, this is the beautiful car, whatever model it may be. And this is the speed that it's running. And this is the performance. It's, 
it's it, it's an important thing to do, but that's critical. And if I can make an analogy, since I think I'm talking about cars, and I, I don't know why but the whole thing about F1 just popped into my head, is you literally have a whole team. And you have different folks focusing on different parts, but collectively, it is exactly that. It's that end-to-end -end perspective from the pure hygiene, you know, the, 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 the um, efficacy of the thickness of the tar on, on the road or the wheels and so forth, and the speed in which the car is operating and those bad performance that's being achieved. That's really what needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah, and you're absolutely right in saying it's doing both things together is one that is difficult to get and you you mentioned uh, at, at the start that i often talk about my failures and successes in those in that order um, and one of my early failures um, which came out of a success was that because i had a very big regulatory mandate um, almost unchallenged for several years to do what i needed to do to fix the bank i overlooked the importance of explaining why doing all this is important beyond um, just Oh, that's a, that's, a, that, that's a quite a powerful statement. I think it's a very important one. Yeah. But I, I, I want to piggyback on that one and, and kind of moving in terms because you, you've kind of, I, I don't know what you call it, upstream or downstream to the application. I mean, AI at the end of the day is an application of data if you kind of yeah. break it down to its components. And you touched on something really important there as to I am empowered due to regulatory uh, um, mandate to a certain extent. Now, while that is, I would say to a certain extent, happening in the world of AI, and, and maybe we'll touch that in a second, especially when the EU AI Act, et cetera, and so forth, but largely AI is an unregulated space. I mean, even if, if you can also look at the component of AI, look in terms of data, in spaces outside of financial services and healthcare and maybe a, a, literally a handful others, there is no uh, stick to give that the rightful or wrongful kind of mandate to just get certain things done. So if we do focus on AI, how do we take those learnings of the importance of making sure um, environments, engagements, applications, uh, services are built properly? And as we were just discussing earlier in terms of data, there is that connectivity for the business to understand, look, this is the performance that you're getting. Because ultimately that's what governance, at least in my mind, gives you. Yeah, I actually think it's an easier journey mm. with AI. Uh, the reason I think that is uh, because with data on its own, without the kind of the predictive benefits, et cetera, you are away as a CDO going away and doing your own data governance, data management, and neither the work nor the benefits came to the rest of the bank if you've just kept it within your work. But in, with, a, with respect to AI, there is a fundamental difference. Mm -hmm. Most of it does not work and it, in, in real life large enterprises. And the reason it does not work in real life large enterprises comes down to data. <laughs> so I think it's much easier to win this argument. So wait, 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 wait. I, I want to double click on that one because you just yeah. said something, it does not work. You can you can look at every kind of stats out there, including I think this week's Economist has, has an article on how how little productivity has gone up despite uh, the first time the Financial Times interviewed me on the big AI transformation in financial services was in 2018, February or April 2018. It's six years out, and we're still not dramatically better. Of course, there are pockets where mm. there have been adoption, but 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 it's not much higher. And and a very big reason is not regulation is not always oh, scared of regulation. It's because the data that financial institutions in particular have uh, is either not enough or it's not in a form, and in a, in, a, in a consumable form that allows them to build the kinds of insights, never mind advanced data, et cetera. That's why it is so, so for me, the data governance and data management argument is much easier to make with AI because without that, all this excitement around doesn't work. generative AI or any kind of AI, it's going to peter out. Yeah. It's happened already. I mean, basically, people in financial services got a fresh wave of interest in AI just in the last 12 to 18 months because generative AI came about. Otherwise, there was a lot of decline in interest over the time. Over time, say, it's not giving us as much. Not decline, relative decline in yeah. the rate of interest increasing because people didn't see the benefits come. What you make? I mean, and again, I don't, I don't want to be the Grinch here. but. Does, is that worrying in a certain degree? Because if, you, if you're thinking of, A, it doesn't work, and 
I, you know, the more I think about it, I fully agree because at the end of the day, the data is the fuel of AI. And if you don't have your fuel in order and you're kind of sticking in some engine oil, sorry, you know, <laughs> cooking oil, yeah, funky things are going to happen downstream. So absolutely. So you have that as a realistic challenge. So it kind of that provides a lens of, okay, we really need to sort out this stuff. Yeah. But now, like I was saying, you are seeing, and again, there's a reason for it. Regulatory, you know, governance, uh, some are policy, some are purely advisory requirements that are kind of popping up across the world, specifically with respect to the application of it. And, and I'm honestly still in two minds about it. I, on one hand, I'm like, yes, it's good because there are certain um, um, focuses that are needed to be brought up in terms of AI. But then on the other hand, it's like, it's, it's, it's overly kind of segregating AI and you're kind of, you're missing the point, you, you know, it's a, you're not seeing the forest from the trees kind of scenario, but it's actually not about AI, it's about the underlying application. But that aside, it's happening. So it almost feels like you're having a difficulty on top of a difficulty and people are just going to go like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it the way we always do it, just easier. Yeah, I, I think, I think there is a risk of that happening. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure anybody, not not least me, has has figured out the answer on that. But what I would say, both with my previous experience and the experience of about 20 to 30 clients and, and partners that I've seen in the last uh, three years, um, uh, a, a somewhat privileged position of being a relatively small startup vendor, but also someone who's kind of uh, uh, seen the, it from the inside. So what I would say is that I think it's useful to break up the problem and not start with the AI regulation or AI regulatory guidelines, but instead start with what do we need to make this successful? Never mind for a moment the regulator, right? Let's take real life applications. Let's take your and my favorite area, financial crime. Right? Mm. Okay, can I build good predictive models to either detect financial crime or to support the investigation of financial crime efficiently if I do not have good data? Good meaning, good quality, good meaning representative of my world? No. Okay. No. Therefore, data management part of the requirements, which is one subset of the AI governance, AI guideline requirement, a lot of it is taken care of because you are going to focus on representative data, good quality, like data that is broad enough to give you the right results. So that's taking part of one of one area. You also mentioned not worrying about AI-specific regulation, but focusing instead on what you were doing in this case, anti-money laundering or sanctions, or if you're doing investment advice, then advice around, uh, sorry, requirements around uh, your, your, uh, your duty of care to your customers. Well, focus on that. Don't worry about the air regulation for a moment. Focus on what you need for the algorithm to work, which is mainly around data governance and around systems that are reliable, et cetera. Then focus on your specific area. What are my requirements for whether it's AI or not AI, for a good quality predictive model that detects um, potential financial crime, right? If I focus on these two, yeah. my sense is about 70 to 80% of the broader so-called AI guidelines get taken care of. Now, which yeah. ones don't get taken care of? And that's where some of the uh, kind of potential debate, like you said, you're also in two minds, uh, despite having been the one who came up with the first of these guidelines. <laughs> um, I, I think it's it's fair. It's, it's very good to reflect on kind of what you've done and we all supported you in doing it. Um, I think the, the, the areas of disagreement come where it's neither directly flowing from the need to make the algorithm work well, nor flowing from the requirements of the specific area of application, financial crime, wealth management, whatever. So what are those? I mean, clearly one of those that comes up is fairness. Another that has more recently come up is around IP rights and you know who has yes. access, particularly with use of foundation uh, models, et cetera. Right? So if you pick those two, neither of those automatically come in the context of, you know, I need to make my model work for the vast majority. Because when you think about making something work, you think, let me at least make it work for the vast majority. Well, actually that doesn't work very well if you're looking at it from a fairness angle. And certainly the IP angle doesn't come up when you're thinking about, I mean, yes, it is a form of data governance, but you don't think about IP or, you think about privacy, but not about IP as much, right? Oh, you now so, do because of Gen AI and the whole no, thing. No, now you do. I'm saying it in the pre, before this, so I guess what I'm trying to do is if you, if you take the big fat blob of AI governance and isn't it making life too complex, my 
Yes. My claim is that if you just did what you needed to do to yes. make a bloody good application, if you're using a, a large language model, then you're not necessarily building the model, but you're building a good application that is respectful of the limitations of the large language model, or if it's your own model or you're doing fine tuning, etc., that has the right training data, right uh, database for the retrieval of meta generation, etc. So if you do, in other words, what it takes to build a good AI-enabled application, good, not compliant, good, and you do what is needed for your respective area of application, which is money laundering or anti-money laundering or, or, or investment advice, et cetera. My claim is 70 to 80% of the so-called AI guidelines are taken care of. And all that's left is a bit of fairness, is a bit of IP rights, a bit of environment sensitivity, which is all oh. valid things, right? No, absolutely. How compute intensive is it and all these things. Shami, you, you always have a way of really articulating things. And, and, and you, I was just thinking it, and I really love the way you just said it, that, if you focus on building good models. Again, I'm overgeneralizing, of course, there will always be a set that even if you build a good model, it may not be compliant, but fundamentally, if you focus on the business value, if you focus about what is it that you're trying to achieve, you focus on building a good model, you will find that the derivative of that is the compliance, essentially. And, 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 and to really kind of expand on that, and I actually had this thing. So, so you mentioned about in terms of you know discrimination, and it could be any attributes. And, and remember, and for the listeners, and Shamik was a phenomenal contributor to the feed principles, fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency, which released back in, what was it, 2018? Yep. 2018, 2018, so, so a while ago. Um, and we had a whole debate about, oh, should we exclude or include certain attributes? And uh, it kind of came about by saying, well, hey, you're dealing with maybe not that the, the, the nature of large as they are large today, but even then, large models, it's even if you exclude an attribute, it will be derived. And if you're dealing with a smart data scientist, they'll figure out a way. So at the end of the day is, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And if you think about, um, Again, avoid the traditional one of, let's say, gender. Simply look at the, the, the skewness with respect to attributes. It's just hygiene. That's common sense of the practices of building a good model. If you don't do those things at the onset, I would argue, I'm sorry, you, you, you do not have good practices of model development. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So a, a, a biased model, a, I think it's it's always a sensitive topic topic in the U.S. But for the rest of the big world, there is a lot of historical context that makes particularly racial bias a big concern. But at least for the rest of the world, where the problems are not fewer, but I think people can be a bit more rational in how they approach it. I would say a biased model is first, first and foremost a crappy model, like you said. You followed, <laughs> you followed bad practice. Fix those. Get those no, no. working. I, I would add one thing, though. I think it is important to build a good model, or if you're using somebody else's model, a good application on top. But it's also important, I just think people often miss this, particularly people who are coming in from outside financial services and think, why is this industry not adopting? I also think it is important to consider whether, however good my model is, whether it is the appropriate thing to use yes. in this particular context. Absolutely. And that's something people don't put enough thought to. So let me take a very brutal one. And actually, AI yeah, doesn't get used here. Thank God for that. Uh, sanction screening, right? Yeah, I might be able to use a predictive model to guess that this person's name is on the sanctions list. Now I'm not talking anti money laundering. I'm talking about terrorist financing kind of thing, like yeah. immediate, immediate alert to... But even if I get it right 99 times, the one time that I get it wrong is not it like the danger or the, or the downside from that is so high that it is not appropriate in this case to use, you know, something that is not near closed. Of course, in reality, people use fuzzy logic models. Yeah, yeah. So there is a level of uncertainty there. It's not that there's zero uncertainty. But all things considered, for sanction screening, I would much rather err on the side of I'm going to use something that is not going to cause harm. And in this case, of course, the harm definition here is, I mean, I have, I have people, I won't name it, but I have people in my team, somebody you know as well, whose name happens to be close to that of a listed terrorist. He cannot travel to any country, right? And it's problematic even without probabilistic systems. Oh, I imagine yeah. if you also had probabilistic systems, which is this name sounds like it could be the same as that 
I mean, this is just going to be ridiculously yeah. bad. So I think that's just a very simplistic example where I would say it is important to build a good model or a good AI-enabled application, and it is important to consider whether that solution, that AI-enabled solution you're considering, is the right one for this use case. Once you do, do these two, you are left with very few additional considerations yeah. for governance or compliance yeah. that you didn't already meet. So, I mean, it kind of brings two things here. One is really the emphasis. Again, okay, obviously, I, I, we, to a certain degree, we both do come world of data come from. I obviously, I'm biased with respect to the value that it brings, and having seen it deliver those values. So, I'll start with that. But to achieve that value, because I don't know if you've if heard this, I've, I've had so many times, whether it is you know boards and private conversations, being asked the question, David, why aren't we seeing value? You know, we're investing, we're doing da 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 but we're not seeing that underlying value. And at times, when you take a step back and you look at what's happening is you're realizing that this kind of sequence of events may not be fully occurring, which is, well, what is the business? What are you focusing on? What is it that you're trying to do? And sometimes it's really a shotgun approach of, you know, what is it, a Kevin Costa film, you know, build it and they will come. Just AI and it will happen. It's like, no, it's, are you trying to build a new business? The assumptions or considerations are very different. Are you trying to improve an existing one? Are you focusing on a problem? What is it? Then to your point, and I really like, I really like the way you, you said it. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to steal that. Is it's really about fundamentally focusing on building a good model. And fully agree with you. It is the context that's critical. And actually, I, I know it's a sensitive area, especially in the context of the US and to some degree in Europe and others. Let's say thinking about you know biasness and discriminatory due to historical uh, occurrences. But that exactly brings up that consideration of context. Can I build a model? Yes. Should I apply a model? Well, maybe the answer is no, because we know as a fact that data may be contaminated. So then it becomes a lot. You see, so now it becomes an element that you actually need to apply, ironically, human smart, you know, HI, in that underlying process of contextualizing, identifying the relevancy, I seeing whether, you know, if I make a reference to, you know, Zikin from uh, Infocom, well, previously it was Infocom Media Development Authority in Singapore, you know, whether it's human in the loop, over the loop, or outside the loop. Yeah. And arguably, you would find that very, very few cases um, would be outside the loop, there will be, but there's few cases. You have over the loop, I would say majority, and then some, it's, it's, it's basically all AI is is an extra set of information, an extra set of knowledge that is supporting you in that underlying process effectively. And this differentiation is what ultimately, and again, in my view, and I'd love to have your perspectives, is what's critical in terms of making it work. Yeah. So I would support everything you say, but I would actually take it one step further. I think the question is not just, is this model suitable in our context because it may give you biased results. I know this is difficult to do in certain legal and jurisdictional, uh, certain legal jurisdictions. But if you are not subject to those, you should even think, I know it is biased, but is it less or more biased <laughs> than the current human alternative? Well, the if reality it is, is... It is less biased, then maybe it is worth doing well, it. Well, right? well, Shamik, you, you, you bring up another sensitive thing. See, this is what I meant by psych conversations that sometimes doesn't happen on the panel, is a lot of times, we don't even admit that we don't have a baseline. We don't know our degree of biasness at the current point. I, I, a perfect example is, you know, okay, so AI, very important. Make sure that, let's say, giving loans or credit cards or whatnot, product, we don't have biasness. Sure. In your current process, what is your biasness? Oh, Some we didn't even think about that. I mean, it's, it's actually recorded in the MAS Veritas. Uh, I think it's the transparency stream, but also in one of the other streams. It is recorded as, there was a section on, areas for future consideration. And one of them was, hey, we are applying all these nice rules to AI, uh, not rules, but guidelines. Mm. But actually, I realized you can't apply these if you're not applying it to the rest of the decisions, the ones which were not taken using AI. Uh, so we have to make them consistent, because otherwise, you can't say it. So, so I think, and I, I, I know it, these considerations, uh, these, these, this approach cannot be taken in every jurisdiction. Certainly our part of the world, it can be, which is a very sensible, you know, I know this thing is not perfect, but with my eyes open, I can see that it does not break the law. Of course, there's always a requirement <laughs> to not break the law, right? That is a good requirement. That's a good requirement. It is a good requirement. It should not break the law, and it is causing less harm than the existing alternative. 
Well, then let's use it. And then let's also focus on improving it. I had an example of really focusing on improving it. In this case, we chose to not use it till we approved it. It was relatively narrow, which was a facial recognition system in Hong Kong uh, to, to have you upload your selfie and then compare it to your uploaded Hong Kong ID card because they didn't have my info back then or the equivalent of that. And then you would match that the two are the same. Um, everything sounded fine, except the algorithm was bought from, I think, an East Asian uh, software company. So I, being a South Asian who's been in Hong Kong for a while, uh, or seen Hong Kong for a while, I immediately asked, is this train in Hong Kong? I said, no. Well, actually, our bank has a lot of South Asian and Caucasian customers in Hong Kong. And so it's likely that you'll have more false positives and or false negatives for that group. Can you check that? Check. Sure enough, it was. In that case, I can't remember what was done, but I can remember that there's, I'm sorry, I can think of multiple solutions. You could choose to go ahead and say, actually, if there is a positive or negative for one of these races, we will pay extra attention. Maybe not stop it during the day, but at the end of the day, we'll do a special audit because it's a small minority so that we are making sure that none of them have been inappropriately. Or secondly, actually, the cost of failure is not too much if you get rejected. If the main problem is it's a false negative in this case, uh, okay, then all that happens is you're not allowed to do online onboarding, but you should in such situations allow branch-based onboarding within a certain service level. So I guess all I'm trying to say is in this instance, by acknowledging that there might be a problem like this, measuring it, looking at the scale of the problem, you can choose to either not introduce it or introduce it with caveats or introduce it with additional guardrails. This is what can be done in most jurisdictions. I'm not sure you could do this in the US, probably not. I, I, would, I would even say, uh, you use the word problem, but I would say it's not even a problem. It's perhaps a perspective. Um, and a lot of times, and understandably, I mean, look, we always focus into our particular areas and, and our expertise and so forth. And, you know, every, a hammer wants to nail everything kind of scenario. It's actually about process. Everything you yeah. describe right now, it's about having the lens on the process. It's not about yeah. seeing whether it's data or whether it's AI or whatever new fancy tool that would come along as this magical red button that you click and just things happen and poof. It's really taking that holistic perspective on how to make it work. And then also, to be very candid, um, taking that holistic or comprehensive view oh, as much as possible to you know what, it's just not applicable. Maybe in this particular case, we just need a room. Or in this particular case, it is a human judge because that is the best that we can do or the best that we can trust, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in building those elements. I mean, so Shamik, look, uh, you've kind of been from the trenches and all that and been into the data, data management. And, and I kind of think we, we kind of said it without saying it, that that stool the heart <laughs> of of this entire paradigm, even though you know the AI is the I don't know the, the sexy stuff in the end and always it's it, this is still really the, the 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 pulse that kind of makes it work. And then of course now stream in terms of those application AI and again the due diligence and the governance and the importance of understanding how to make it work. But if it's even possible to surmise, looking at it from that perspective that this is a space that derives value. It is. I mean and there are so there are enough cases that people go, why not? I mean, we, we won't do that as well. What would be, I, I don't know if there is, by the way, yeah. but what would be that the high level like secret source that you would kind of recommend to someone, look, these are the X things, these are the things you need to focus on. There's a lot of distractions, there's a lot of other, but these are like the, 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 the guiding stars. The problem there you already hinted at it is it's not a secret source at all. <laughs> And just follow the process. I mean, it will sound really, really boring. I'm also an ex-consultant, but it is exactly like a consultant's handbook. Start with your business objectives. Look for whether AI, if that's what indeed what you're trying to do, is the right solution for this. If it is, try and figure out whether you'll build your own model or you'll buy, take some. So these are all very basic stops. I would go back, David, to your point, which is actually don't keep, don't assume it's a single red button. Go through the pain of of everything that needs to be done. Now, some of that bed is going down with recent advances in technology. For example, if you're in the area of language models, you can actually use somebody else's language model as a starting point without having had to. So some things will be reduced, but at the core of it, you have to ask those very basic questions. At the end of the day, this is a predictive model. It is predicting based on data it has seen before. That data might be the whole world's data, 
or it might be, you know, just, you know, your company's data. And therefore, if you have a use case for which there isn't a lot of precedent, don't expect it to suddenly deliver results. The vast majority of use uh, of of disappointment in AI comes because not because it's biased, but because it's not producing the kinds of results I expected. Then make it better than my alternatives. Well, maybe you didn't pick the case that actually is suited for that. So unfortunately, there's no secret sauce, <laughs> David. I think it's going through the the grunt work of you know, is this the right use case? Do I have the right data? Am I using, I mean, like I said, I think what is changing over time, uh, this is certainly my insight over the last three years, is another of my mistakes. This one is not a mistake. Another thing that I would do differently if I was going back to my CDO days. I don't think back then the technology to even manage data, never mind the AI ML ops technology, just the, the technology to manage data itself was not that good back when I started. So we did a lot more through human means, right? yeah. whether it is, trolling through a lot of existing data and trying to give you a crude dictionary without having a human doing it. That's something that is now feasible with a lot of the recent uh, technology features. Or using uh, machine learning uh, to, to assess potential data quality issues. This is something I, uh, we started doing back then. Now it is much more mainstream, I understand. So I do think the fundamentals of data management have not changed and they're all very boring. Nor have the fundamentals <laughs> of but maybe the fundamentals of AI have changed in terms of how that those models work. But fundamentally, you're still trying to build models that predict what should be the case, yeah. what is the correct answer. Those haven't changed. What has changed, I certainly feel, this is my lesson from my last three years, is that the level of tooling and technology that is available to people, and also, frankly, the level of experience that is available uh, to the market has increased much further. Yeah. Of course, as the experience part, I expect it. But the technology part, I'm quite surprised how much of my past job would have become easier. I mean, I, I was just giving this example to someone yesterday. We spend, I would say, tens of billions of dollars putting hundreds of engineers to review code, uh, legacy code that was written in an anti-money laundering uh, uh, system. Most of that, with at least equivalent capability, uh, quality, if not better, would now be like this with... Uh, a code extra, uh, like a, a Gen AI or, or large language model that reads the code and produces an English description. I've tried this with, with Python scripts and SQL scripts. You can actually get, it won't be accurate, but nor were my army of engineers. So that was a big part of my agenda for two years and that can be automated. So I would say what you need to do as it changed, the tools you have available today to do that has certainly evolved quite a bit. Yeah. On that note, because we can continue talking about this because it's it's just amazing despite how long you know i've been doing it you've been doing it there is always more to uncover and discuss but on that note actually i think it's a perfect one to kind of bring conclusion because and to surmise it it's really kind of a couple of points and the most important one is there is no secret source actually that is a extremely powerful statement a lot of times people look at it and think like oh there has to be some special secret that they're doing every there actually isn't a secret source and to your point, and I, I, I like that, is it's boringly systematic. It's the ability and due diligence and following that systemic, systematic approach effectively and applying all those principles of is it relevant, is it the right context, what does it mean, is it one part of many things, what needs to be involved, and so forth, and the realization that, in fact, it is a, well, a heck of a lot easier today than it was a few years ago. It will get easier, of course, because this is the whole point of progress, you know, uh, uh, the, the availability of, of technology. Heck, I always complain that, you know, when, when I speak to, to you know, data scientists and my team, other teams are like, you guys don't code, you just code libraries. I coded, you know, I wrote backpropagation algorithms. I want to see you do that from scratch. So it is, I guess the message there is we have, it's really about having the business, okay, where relevance motivation and ambition to really go down the road and say, we want to explore this spot and baseline where it provides value. If it provides value, we go down path it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's, it's all good. It May it's a different type of iteration. So, Shamik, it's been absolutely wonderful. I think there's a lot of learnings here, especially for me. Thank you for coming on board. And, and like I said, doing the first iteration with me, like literally just the, the side conversation, <laughs> uh, data, AI, and everything. Thank you for joining us this week on the Data, AI, and Everything podcast. 
make sure you visit our website at aboetesdayatinnovation.com where you can subscribe to the podcast and find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 